We're here to tell the story of an audacious prison escape that happened here exactly 100 years ago, one cold February evening, when Eamon de Valera, who later went on to become Prime Minister and President of Ireland, and two other Irish rebels, Sean McGarry and Sean Milroy, escaped from Lincoln Prison and walked to freedom down that very road behind me. They were aided in their escape by Michael Collins, a rebel so iconic they made a film about him. It was actually played by Liam Nielsen who is considered that call. Eamon de Valera was born in 1882 in New York to an Irish mother and a Spanish father. His dad died shortly after he was born, so at the age of two he was sent to Ireland to be brought up by his grandmother. He grew up to be a maths teacher, but gradually drifted into Irish nationalist politics. The political situation in Ireland was becoming increasingly polarised between those mainly in the north of the island, who wished to remain subjects to the British Crown, and nationalists who wished to break away from the British Empire. Like many young Irishmen, De Valera joined the Irish language movement in his 20s, and in 1913 joined the newly founded Irish Volunteers, a nationalist military organisation set up to counter the loyalist unionist militia, the Ulster Volunteers, set up a year earlier. In 1914, World War I broke out, and while thousands of Irishmen volunteered to fight for the British Army and served with distinction on the Western Front in Flanders and Northern France, some Irishmen believed that Britain's misfortune was Ireland's opportunity. A rising was organised against the British, but it was poorly organised, and outside Dublin there was barely a ripple. Inside the city, the capital city of Ireland, the fighting was fierce, 500 people, half of them civilians, died in the fighting before the rising was eventually crushed. Eamon de Valera was one of the leaders, though he probably never fired a shot. In the short term, the rising was a failure, and in five days the rebels surrendered to British forces that included elements of the Lincolnshire Regiment. As the rebels were paraded through the streets of Dublin to prisons, the locals jeered them for the death and damage they'd caused. Irish opinion soon changed as the British started to execute the rebels. Ninety were sentenced to death, but only fifteen were actually shot before the British halted the process. Eamon de Valera was, had been the next due to be shot and had even written a final letter to his family when the decision to stay his execution was made. Some wonder whether the British were concerned about American opinion, as De Valera had been born in the US. In the Lincolnshire archives is a letter directly related to the Rising, written by J.J. Houston, also known as Sean Houston, one of the rebels. Ironically, he had nearly shot fellow rebel Eamon De Valera at the start of the Rising, in the confusion as to whether it had been called off or not. Houston was in command of rebel troops at the Mender City Institute, and on the day the rising started, he was asked to hold it for two hours. With 26 volunteers, he held it for two days against over 300 British troops. When the rebels' ammunition ran out, they were forced to catch the British grenades as they were flung through the windows and thrown back at their enemies. Eventually, they decided to surrender. Houston was executed on the 8th of May, 1916, in Kilmainham Prison, Dublin and wrote a final letter to his work colleagues at the railway station where he was employed, the original of which is in the archives of the University College Dublin. Now someone in the Lincolnshire Regiment decided to type up a copy of the letter, and this typed copy from 1916 is now in the Lincolnshire archives. It says, Before this note reaches you, I shall have said farewell to this vale of tears, and departed for what I trust will prove a much better world. I take this last opportunity of thanking you and all my railway friends for the kindness of past years. I ask you to forgive me for my offences which I may have committed against them and ask you all to pray fervently for the repose of my soul. Whatever I have done, I have done as a soldier of Ireland in what I believe to me my country's best interests. I have, thank God, no vain regrets. After all, it is better to be a corpse than a coward. Won't you see that my mother gets all the assistance you can give her? She will badly need it all. Gratefully yours, signed, J.J. Houston.
The British troops who captured Houston and his comrades didn't think they were valiant heroes. They thought the rebels were traitors, stabbing Britain in the back while the soldiers' comrades died in the mud of Flanders. The rebels were manhandled and beaten in captivity. By 1966, on the 50th anniversary of the Rising, the rebels that had been executed would lauded as martyrs in the Irish Republic, and the station Houston worked at, Kingsbridge in Dublin, was renamed in his honour. The rebels were released in 1917, and now Dave Valera was the most senior surviving Republican. So how did he end up in Lincoln Prison? Well, early in 1918, the British concocted a story that the Irish rebels were plotting with the Germans and had 70 leading Irish rebels rounded up. Half were sent to Usk Prison and the rest, including Dave Valera, were sent to Lincoln. Michael Collins, the head of the Republican Intelligence Network, evaded capture and was soon plotting to get Eamon de Valera out. Prisoners notice a door in an exercise yard that perhaps they thought if we could get through this we could get out to freedom, but they needed a master key. Now Eamon de Valera was a pious Catholic and was soon helping out the chaplain at the chapel. The chaplain was a Father Peter Taylor. When he wasn't looking, Eamon de Valera borrowed his keys and using some wax in a tobacco tin made an impression of the key. Pictures of the key were smuggled out in a cartoon. Copies were made and were smuggled back into the prison in a cake. Luckily, the prison authorities didn't notice that there was a key inside it. The key didn't work. Another impression was made, another drawing was made, smuggled out of the prison, and another key was made outside, smuggled in, in a cake. This was too small and broke in the mechanism. Now, Peter DeLowry, whose biography is an essential source for this story, he took apart one of the locks using the small screwdriver that came with Eamon de Valera's typewriter that he was allowed in prison. They took apart the lock to see how the mechanism worked. Blank keys were smuggled in, files were smuggled in, in another cake. In fact, in total, four cakes were smuggled in to make keys, whilst another was made outside for Michael Collins. Now, after the escape, the prison authorities were baffled how they got out because they thought the best watch had been kept on their correspondence. As they said, the most strictest watch was maintained on him in prison. No friend or relative was allowed to see him or his comrades, and they were permitted to write and receive only three letters each weekly. The most stringent censorship was maintained over their correspondence, and both incoming and outgoing letters had to pass through London for inspection. Perhaps they should have inspected the cakes a bit closer. With the key made and working, plans were put in place to whisk them away once they got outside. The rebels feared that there would be extra security put on because some other Irish rebels had just escaped from Usk prison. Outside were Michael Collins, Harry Boland and Frank Kelly. They were in charge of the plans for getting the prisoners away once they'd escaped. Frank Kelly had been drinking in the local pubs and making friends with some of the prison guards to try and get some information out of them. Now, they knew that they would be able to see a signal from the prison because in a letter sent out, one of the prisoners said, standing at the window, I smoke a cigar and Dave Valera watches the stars. My cigar must look like a, an evolving star. It can be seen as far as the road. Well, on that evening, the men outside flashed their torch and the prisoners inside lit matches to say that they're all ready. They unlocked the doors, the escaping prisoners, and carefully locked them on their way out to confuse the authorities once the uh, escape had been discovered. They wore multiple layers of socks over their boots so their feet wouldn't crunch on the gravel and because Milroy's boots were so worn away that the sole was flapping as he walked down the corridor. When they got to the gate outside, Mike Collins, Frank Kelly and Harry Boland heard the prisoners 
escaping prisoners approached the door. Collins inserted his key in, turned the key and disaster, it snapped. Well, Eamon de Valera, cool as a cucumber, took his key out, pushed it into the lock, pushing out the broken key that Collins had had made, and it turned smooth as velvet. Once I got outside, there was barely time for a quick greeting. Eamon de Valera rebuked Collins for coming. They were all captured now. That would certainly be a coup for the British. They got together and raced across the allotments, heading for Ragby Road and heading for freedom. Now behind me is Lincoln Christ Hospital School. It had been a hospital during World War I and was still, for a year afterwards, being used for the same function. Often the convalescing soldiers would meet with their girlfriends outside the hospital. Their girlfriends were often nurses at the hospital. And so there was a group talking to their girlfriends, hanging around out here. Now, Frank Kelly went, right, I'll try and see if there's another way round, and vanishes into the mist and vanishes completely out of the story in the records. Collins, Bolan, Dave Valera and the two Shawns waited for a minute and then thought, we're going to have to brazen our way past. Harry Bolan got his large coat, wrapped it round Eamon de Valera, and they linked arms like a courting couple. As they walked through past the soldiers, the soldiers didn't notice that Eamon de Valera's date was a burly Irishman with an Irish accent. They even had the audacity, the escapees, to laugh and joke with the soldiers' girlfriends about what a bitter and cold February evening it was. They got past, turned left, and made their way down Ragby Road. The escaping prisoners made their way along the Ragby Road with the adrenaline pumping in their veins. Possibly their pulses quickened even more as they hurried past the Peacock pub, as Kelly would have no doubt warned them that that was where the prison warders used to drink. They split up here at the Adam and Eve pub. They'd booked a taxi. Now, wartime petrol restrictions and travel restrictions were still in place. So they couldn't get a taxi all the way from here to their safe house in Manchester. So they booked a taxi, telling the taxi driver, who was completely innocent of, uh, and unaware of who he was taking, that they needed to connect with the training workshop. So the taxi was waiting here for Eamon de Valera, Sean Milroy and Sean McGarry. They weren't to know it, but it was still three and a half hours before the alarm was raised at the prison. They would have had time for a pint, but they never went in, which is a shame because they serve a good beer here. Meanwhile, Collins and Boland plodded down the hill and took a train back to London. When they got to Worksop, there was another taxi waiting for Eamon de Valera and the other two escapees from there to Sheffield and from Sheffield, a car waiting to drive them to Manchester and freedom. When the news got out, the escape was a sensation and the Irish Republicans squeezed every drop of propaganda out of it that they could. They gate crashed a Paris peace conference trying to get recognition for an independent island and their representative tried to embarrass the British by spreading stories about the jailbreak. He said there were soldiers on guard at the back of the prison patrolling the area, which wasn't true. He said two pretty female university graduates were sent over from Dublin and pretended to be shop girls where they flirted and distracting the guards. Again, not true. He claimed four cars full of Republicans went careering round the Lincolnshire, distracting the police. His most inventive story concerned the allotments at the back of the prison. An Irishman working on the allotments was alleged to have relayed messages to the prisoners by singing Gaelic songs over the barbed wire. This was a cunning lie. It reminded the world that the Irish had their own language and the English sometimes literally couldn't understand them. The local papers easily saw through the smoke screen. The Lincoln Small Holders Association promptly denied that any of the allotment holders were Irish and anyway, the plots near the prison were worked by the warders. But it wasn't public opinion in Lincoln the rebels were trying to influence. Their stories had gone global. The ironic thing about the whole escape is the rebels suspected they were about to be released. They needed to get out before the British let them out as the German plot was obviously nonsense. It suited the rebels to make the British look oppressive and incompetent, not magnanimous. The whole spectacular escape 
does have a rather charming postscript. De Valera had been the Prime Minister of the Irish Republic, but in 1950, during a brief period out of office, he went on a lecturing tour of Britain. He was due on Sunday afternoon to give a talk at the Radian Cinema in Lincoln, where BBC Radio Lincolnshire is now, to an audience of over 800. That morning, he went to the local Catholic church, St Hugh's Church on Monks Road, for the morning service, where the priest was none other than Peter Taylor, the prison chaplain whose keys De Valera had borrowed three decades earlier. The local paper reports that after church and with an hour to kill before lunch, De Valera and his friends spontaneously decided to visit the scene of their escape. They piled into a car, drove up the hill to the prison where they knocked on the door. But the governor kindly offered to take them to visit the cell De Valera had once occupied. This charming story of a nostalgic tour of the prison made on a whim is, like many parts of this affair, a bit propaganda. The same newspaper that reported the visit had given the game away in a previous edition when it reported permissions had been sought formally and been given formally for De Valera to visit his old cell that coming Sunday. Three years after the escape, Michael Collins died in Ireland's bloody civil war, fighting on the opposite side to many of the other rebels in this story. But soon most of Ireland slowly gained its independence and De Valera eventually became a prominent statesman. Eamon de Valera was the longest serving Prime Minister of Ireland, holding the office three times between 1932 and 1959, before serving 14 years as President, dying in 1975, two years after leaving office. While many in Ireland look back quite critically at his time in office, he certainly played a vital part in one of the most audacious prison escapes ever. <laughs>